Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Words of Wisdom, aka Words of Wisdom, and welcome to episode number two of Drawing with your boy, Words. Today, we're actually gonna be drawing a horse. 12 seconds later. <laughs> oh my fucking god. <laughs> oh man. I I love drawing. I, I really do. E even if I'm not very good at it. Both as a kid and as an adult today, drawing has always fascinated me. In fact, my drawings are even included in my videos more often than not. Remember this one or this one? Yep. They're all words of wisdom originals. And like I know they're looking worse than Google images I could have used instead, but it's just so much fun to do and, more importantly, they're things I created. Drawing just allows you to be creative, to create whatever's on your mind at that very moment. No matter if it's real or fictional, no matter if it's beautiful or garbage. I'm sure most of the three and a half people watching this video draw in their like boarding class or on a plane, it's just a common thing most of us like. But have you ever wondered what it would be like if your drawings came to life? Welcome to Drawn to Life, where your drawings come to life. When this game released in 2007, I was just about 10 years old. I remember getting this game from my local game store and beating it over and over again because of how much I liked the game. The excessive amount of drawing and being able to interact with said drawings continuously was all I needed to have the time of my life. On top of that, I remember perceiving the game as quite challenging as a kid, but not in a bad way. The game was challenging enough to make me feel like I had achieved something when I beat a level, but it never got to a point where I felt frustrated in regards to the difficulty. This perfect difficulty in combination with literally drawing the very things you use in the entire game made me feel like this was one of the best games to ever exist. But now, it's 2021, 13 years later. And I have quite literally doubled in age. So I figured it was about time to figure out if this game is really as good as I thought it was back then. Drawn to Life takes place in a world that's inhabited by Raposa, which are fox-like creatures that were drawn by the creator, aka the player, a long time ago. The creator supposedly abandoned the Raposa world after they created it and a lot has happened during the time they were gone. The game's story begins with a Raposa called Mary, who's crying out for help to the creator. A once very successful village has been abandoned by pretty much everyone and Mary tells the creator they are their very last hope. The creator decides to help them in repopulating the village and this is where you get to draw the character you play the entire game with. After exploring the village for a bit, you then run into Wilfer, who turns out to be the main villain of the game. It turns out that Wilfer was once a respected member of the village who liked to dabble in creation, but his lust for power pretty much made him lose his mind. As a result of that, Wilfer spawned in an army of shadow monsters that locked up the former village members in several occasions. But not only that, Wilfer also stole the Book of Life and tore up most of the pages, causing the creator's drawings to disappear and the world to turn grim. At the start of the game, Mary, her friend Joey and her father the mayor, are the last remaining villagers and they've almost given up all hope. It is now the creator's task to rescue the villagers from the shadow army, find the missing pages from the book of life so the creator can once again draw the missing objects from the village and defeat Will for once and for all, so peace can be restored. Your first task is to find the page of the eternal flame in the first level of the game. This eternal flame is particularly important because it plays a pivotal part in saving the village. You see, at the start of the game, the entire village is shrouded in dark clouds. Every time you beat a level, you rescue three villagers, with one of them being tied to a certain new location that needs to be unlocked. 
Every time you beat a level, you can touch the eternal flame with your stylus, which will cause the clouds to turn grey in a certain area. Upon touching these grey clouds with your stylus, they will disappear and this is basically how you unlock more and more of the village each time you beat a level. From this point onward, every level has a bit of a substory to it once you beat it. It usually starts with talking to the mayor, who will first greet the three returning villagers and then places the collected page back in the book of life. Since every page of this book revolves around a creator's drawing, you then get to draw whatever object you collected the page for. This variates from things such as a night sky because it was eternally day, to a clock because time was standing still, to an umbrella to protect the Raposa from the sunlight. Although some objects are more important than others, it's really cool to just walk around the city and seeing the things you created. Whether that's the doobie shaped clock hands, the terrible looking crops, or the restaurant sign where I memed about this dude's food. You even have this self-made observatory to look at the self-made night sky. Now, that's next level. Anyway, like I said, there's always a bit of a sub-story after each level. You rescue three villagers per level, with two of them being filler members and one of them actually having a personality. Upon returning to the village and doing some of the Book of Life stuff, this one villager also has their own story to it, to have some more content than just enter level, beat it, go next. This story can literally be anything. Whether you rescue a criminal that goes around stealing stuff, whether you rescue a girl that for some reason can talk, whether you rescue a singer that decides to give a concert, anything is possible. These sub-stories don't just consist of static cutscenes, usually the player has a bunch of tasks to fulfill in order to unlock the next cutscene. Usually these aren't very hard or anything, most of the time you just have to look for person X in location Y, watch a cutscene and do the same thing again. But hey, it feels interactive at the very least. One thing I really like about these little sub-stories is how they are used to tie the different levels together. Usually these village parts of the game take about 10 to 15 minutes and the way they transition to presenting a reason to find the next page is honestly very impressive to me. You never really know where things are going and then, without even realizing it, the developers present a valid reason to find the next page in order to draw something that the village actually kinda needs. But what I might appreciate even more is the fact that they make the village feel more alive. Every sub-story functions as the next step of the village's development and by the end of the game I was just walking past locations thinking to myself, alright, that's when this and this happened. It truly feels like the creation of an imaginary timeline. Besides that, the developers also paid attention to the characters themselves in these sub-stories, because they more often than not include village members in these new sub-stories that you rescued in like, the first three levels. Because of these village members returning in more than one cutscene, you actually develop a bond with these characters. You get to learn who they are instead of them just being generic village characters that you meet once and then they just roam around the village to fill space. I personally felt attached to some of these characters and I think that's a very important feature that can make or break a game. The village event that I like the most by far though is the snowball fight. This little minigame is at the start of the game and it's most definitely my favorite village related thing in this entire game. It's just this little minigame where it's you versus all of the villagers in a snowball fight. You run around the town, pick up snowballs and try to snowball the villagers down before they snowball you down. It doesn't even matter if you lose, the game just goes on afterwards, as if nothing happened. It really sucks that there aren't more of these fun little minigames in this game. I would have loved to have some of the cutscene stuff replaced by an interactive board game versus the villagers or a game of basketball for like an extra life or something, instead of running around the town to find villager X for the next cutscene. But hey, who am I right? Now, while I have nothing extraordinarily bad to say about the village, the real gameplay obviously takes place in the levels. This game has three worlds with four levels and one world with three levels, each of which can be accessed by one of these gates in different parts of the village. Your goal inside of these levels is pretty simple. Explore the level in order to find three missing villagers and the four pieces of the page of the Book of Life that you're looking for. Oh, and you also have to clean the shadow goo of the level with your stylus, but that feature was so pointless and forgettable that I don't even feel the need to talk about it. You progress through the level, go back and forth with your stylus and um, 
that's that's it really. Anyway, usually the level has multiple sections that are accessed by walking through what I'd consider a loading screen. And if you haven't found a villager or a certain template, you can't even progress to the next part. You simply have to find all 7 of those things in order to even beat the level. Aside from those 7 objectives, you can also find 3 secrets per level. These secrets come in the form of 4 different icons which unlock new stamps, drawing patterns, songs or even moves. The only difference between these icons is that a new move only unlocks after finding 3 of these instead of one new unlockable item per icon. Upon unlocking these secrets, they aren't immediately available to you. You first have to buy them from Isaac's shop in the village, which you unlock after like 3 levels by rescuing him. You can get the money needed for these secrets by simply playing the levels. There is money scattered all around the levels and you'd actually have to try very hard to not collect any of it. The prices in Isaac's shop are very cheap, so unlocking whatever you desire really isn't a chore at all. The most expensive things are the moves, which are about 2000 coins and I found myself getting this amount in like 1 or 2 levels most of the time. Did I really use any of the moves, patterns or songs? Not really, but <laughs> I still liked having a monetary system with unlockable features regardless. Now that we're talking about buying things anyway, if you move to the southeast of Isaac's shop, there's this wishing well that also functions as a money dump. You can deposit any amount of money you want and in return you can get things such as extra lives upon hitting a certain money tier. If I'm being brutally honest, I'd consider the wishing well more useful than Isaac's secret shop, but that's more of a preference thing than anything else. If you go back to the levels however, there's one thing I really like about these different kinds of objectives. And that is the fact that they can be found in any corner of the map. You see, this game is a Super Mario Bros like 2D side scroller platform game which provides you with a vastly lower amount of options in terms of creative map design. Despite that, the developers managed to literally make use of the entire map. All of the aforementioned objectives are scattered all around the map and if you want to find all of them, you'll have to check every possible path. Every time I had to pick between different paths, I found myself subconsciously memorizing the paths I didn't explore yet and wanting to go back to see what I missed every single time. They truly made full use of the game design and the map that was available to them. And the different pathways instead of a linear experience most certainly made the game more enjoyable. The most enjoyable feature in this game, however, is right there in the game's title. The drawing. This is the reason why the game is so different and so unique compared to other games. Both in the levels and in the village, you get to draw dozens and dozens of objects that then, well, come to life. The game usually just gives you a certain word you should draw within certain borders and that's pretty much it. The entire canvas is yours. The amount of freedom in these drawings is nothing short of fantastic and the fact that these things can function makes it even better. Wanna draw a moving platform that looks like Spongebob? Go ahead. A ticky that looks really stupid that can jump from point A to point B? Got it. A gust of wind that consists of a turd, cheese and whatever this is? Why the fuck not? You can simply make whatever you want within these borders and more often than not these things can actually move as well. To me it's just so cool that the developers managed to program these objects in such a way that whatever you draw can just function the way they're supposed to, no matter the drawing. It's so cool to see a character that's completely drawn move its legs and arms in more ways than one and seeing a drawn blaster shoot bullets at enemies. It just adds so much to these levels. Not only do the drawings in every level serve a different purpose to make it feel like you're playing a unique level, it's also just really cool to see something you made in the game as a functional feature. Now, while I love the drawing side of things, there are some things I dislike quite a bit. When I said that the game just gives you a word and you can draw whatever you want, I used the word usually, because this sadly isn't always the case. Certain objects in this game like the spaceship, the surfboard and the observatory are supposed to look like and or function in a certain way, which is why these drawings are pre-made and the player is only allowed to color them in. Now I do in fact understand why they did this. If someone draws a giant dick instead of an observatory or just a simple circle instead of a spaceship, it simply doesn't work the way they intended it to. 
The downside to this, however, is that it pretty much defeats the whole creativity side of things. Especially later on in the game, I found myself not giving a damn about these pre-made shapes, after which I just smacked a bunch of colors on it and moved on. Like I said, I think it's completely reasonable, but just giving different shapes some color is nothing short of incredibly boring. Other than that, there sadly are quite a few aspects of the drawing feature that lack in one way or another. And I'm not even talking about the fact that the aforementioned unlockable patterns just look silly in any drawing and aren't useful at all. I truly don't care about that. The biggest issue I have with the drawings is, well, the drawing. A Nintendo DS just isn't meant for precise drawings or anything. Not only is drawing with your finger or with a stylus suboptimal, the screens are just too small to draw a line or an object the way you want. They tried to solve this by giving you an option to zoom in once or twice, but even then the drawing just feels so unresponsive and imprecise. Sure, you can also draw by pressing the A button and moving around with the D-pad, but this will only make your drawing look like an unnatural Minecraft object. Now, this wouldn't be as much of an issue if the pencil size wasn't as scuffed as it is in this game. In this game, you literally only have three pencil sizes. The small one is too big and the big one is so fucking humongous that it feels like you're filling up the entire screen. Every time I zoomed into the max and used a small pencil to draw something precise like facial features, it just didn't work out at all. The pencil didn't draw the shapes I wanted to and the lines were simply too big. What made this even more annoying is the fact that whenever you mess up anything, you can only go back to the previous line. If you mess up two lines in a row and you want both of them gone, you can only press undo for the second line and you'll have to manually erase the first line you drew. This combination of suboptimal features pretty much makes it impossible to draw anything that's even remotely good looking. And that just kinda sucks, especially for someone that likes drawing as much as me. Even though it wasn't a massive issue and I was still able to draw the things I wanted to a certain extent, it just sucked to not be able to draw anything that didn't look like it was made by my 3 year old cousin. I truly do think a PC version of this game would be so much more fitting, since drawing on a 144Hz screen is way easier than something that has a smaller screen than a goddamn cell phone. I mean, just look at the program I make my thumbnails and such in, paint.net. The drawing in this program feels super smooth, you can zoom in up to 6400%, you can literally undo everything up until the first line and you have 7 million features, including pencil sizes available. Just implement these settings, make it a one screen game and voila, drawing issues are solved. Drawing rent aside, I was still able to somewhat make the drawings look the way I wanted them to look and thus the issues I have with the drawing were nothing more than a minor inconvenience. I made Patrick start a sinking ice cube, I made Cloud 6 platforms, a, a scuffed ditto spring and I was a real adult about things when the game asked me to draw uh, dripping goo. Even though it isn't perfect by any means, I was still able to tell what I had drawn and seeing those things function the way they're supposed to was actually really cool. One thing I did really like was the fact that you are able to edit the drawings after finishing them as well. Inside of the levels you can simply click on this palette again to edit an already existing drawing and inside of the village you can edit these drawings by clicking on them as well. What I probably like the most is the fact that you can just edit your character and weapon by opening up the menu, you are also allowed to draw three separate characters in a single save file. I didn't make any use of it because I like my dumb looking character a whole lot, but you can simply bench a character and replace it with a different one if you'd like to, with the option of taking the first one back at any given point. These drawings are also used to add variety to the levels, which means I'll loop back to the aforementioned level design for just a little bit. You see, these different worlds all have different themes and the levels themselves occasionally have different themes as well. World 1 is a snowy world, world 2 is a forest world but there's also a space level for example, world 3 is a water world and world 4 is a Raposa city where you're a giant for some reason, I, I don't know. Every world has these gorgeous looking backgrounds with fantastic color schemes and a variety of themed enemies that, aside from things like the snowball throwing mole, mostly only vary in design and amount of hits that they can take. Although most of the enemies do nothing more than walk in a certain direction until they hit a wall, 
Just their different designs already add a whole lot. But even though the backgrounds and the enemies are different in every world, the game never loses its focus around the drawings. Because the biggest differences between all of the worlds are directly related to them. Whether this comes in the form of the different weapons in every world, the different types of equipment that change the gameplay entirely, or just the random platforms and things you can interact with, the drawings make the game. Whether you're making wings to enable you to triple jump and glide, whether you're making a falling chair to jump to new heights, or whether you're making seaweed to hide from the fish. The drawings define the levels and distinguish them from one another, which is exactly what this game set out to accomplish. Now, while the video up until this point makes it seem like the experience inside of the levels is nearly flawless, there are some major design flaws that pissed me the fuck off. In case you haven't noticed yet, there is one gameplay related thing I haven't mentioned yet. Playing as your drawn character. Well, do I have a thing or two to complain about here? The first problem comes in the form of the character movement. The movement in this game is just not very good. And I mean, there's not a lot to mess up here. You just move left or right and jump, but they somehow still messed it up. The amount of input lag when pressing any button is just inexcusable. As a result of that you have to predict things such as the right time to jump, because if you press jump at the edge of a platform, you will in fact fall off. Where it becomes even more annoying is when you run into an enemy, especially this flying squirrel one. I tried my best to dodge the acorns, I really did, but the controls are so unresponsive and he has a fucking aimbot. It's just so unfair man, I, d I don't know what else to say. But the movement is exceptionally ass underwater. I thought the submarine movement was bad in my Totally Spice video, but... That movement is god tier compared to this. Underwater you have zero control over your character. Every time you press right you just move to the right and hope you don't take any damage before you come to a standstill. Dodging enemies like these fish that actually follow you is literally a mission impossible. Now according to the game mechanics I could just solve this problem by killing them by jumping on top of them or shooting them with my blaster. Well. That doesn't work the way it's supposed to either. The enemy hitboxes aren't accurate at all. When it looks like you're clearly jumping on their head, you're often not actually hitting their hitbox. The game then recognizes it as a miss, they run into you about a millisecond later and you take damage. First I thought I was tripping and I was actually missing, but this space level clip says more than enough. You can't convince me these aren't hits. You just can't. What makes matters worse is the fact that you are able to aim with up and down on the d-pad. The same buttons that are used for the movement. That means if you want to aim your blaster, you either have to do it mid-movement somehow or you have to stand still while enemies just rail you. Why not bind this to R or L instead? I just don't get it. And then I haven't even mentioned the garbage waterworld blaster. I mean, just, just look at this. This blaster is supposed to track enemies, but instead of shooting in a straight line, it just loops around and then hits them, giving them enough time to hit me. It's just infuriating, man. These levels have so many great and fun moments, and they are actually really, really enjoyable. But all of these flaws just leave such a sour taste in my mouth, and this really wasn't needed. It just wasn't. But hey, although the enemies don't really do all that much, the drawing is quite scuffed and the gameplay itself is pretty lackluster at times, the levels are incredibly enjoyable and definitely worth your time. I wish I could say the same about the boss fights though. They're just really standard enemies that you either need to ground pound or shoot and that's really it. Even Wilfer himself just has a bunch of standard attack phases and doesn't even come close to feeling like the final boss. They really just feel like glorified regular enemies rather than anything else. And I'd almost go as far as saying that the game really didn't need these bosses. They should have either made them stand out more or just ditched them completely with an epic will for boss fight in the end. But this is just way too basic to ever get interesting. 
The one standout boss is the forest boss, both because he has two phases and is incredibly unfair during his first phase, since he infinitely spawns shadow enemies and makes you fall through solid platforms while trying to climb up to shoot his quote unquote heart. While this was a frustrating and unfair boss fight, it truly was the only boss worthy opponent. But yeah, that's drawn to life for ya. While this game isn't perfect by any means and a bunch of issues could have easily been avoided, this game is still an absolute blast to play. The worlds look great, the story is simple yet appealing, the drawing and interacting with your drawings all throughout the game is fantastic and exploring the levels never gets boring. Although the game ran out of steam a little bit towards the end, finishing the game never felt like a chore and I never even once felt like I wasn't having a good time. Just exploring the levels in order to find objectives, accompanied by these banger tunes that I've been playing in the background throughout this video, truly was a worthwhile experience. If you're looking for a 15 hour Super Mario Bros like game that is centered around interacting with your own drawings, there isn't a better recommendation than this game. And I think that's where I'll leave it at. If you like this video, definitely leave a like rating. If you liked it even more, then definitely hit that subscribe button. And um, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.